day and today. Our guest is the ambassador of New Zealand to the United States, who's had a uh, most distinguished and interesting career. I don't think he's had an assignment um, which isn't of some note and, and some interest. Uh, his degrees are from uh, Canterbury College and from the co <clears throat> college at Oxford in 65 and 68. His early assignments were first uh, to the Treasury after joining the Department of Foreign Affairs and then in the Economic Division of the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs. He was posted to Tokyo, uh, was an advisor to the Prime Minister. He served uh, as, uh, in Bonn as First Secretary. He was head of the European Division. He was ambassador to Iran and concurrently uh, uh, Turkey and Pakistan. He was then head of the uh, North Asian Division in the Ministry of External Affairs. He also served as Deputy Secretary uh, for Economic Affairs in the Ministry of External Affairs and Trade before being posted most recently, of course, and currently uh, as Ambassador to the United States. So there's a strong, obvious career current in economic affairs, uh, postings to the uh, most interesting of places. Uh, I excluded the fact that he had been DCM here in Washington before when he first uh, uh, started watching the Orioles, who he said had been a disappointment to him. They, they, they entice you and excite you and then disappoint you. I, I didn't mention to the ambassador, though, that I grew up in Chicago as a Cubs fan, and, and, and at least you know where the Cubs aren't going to be. But we're delighted to be joined uh, by Ambassador Wood, and it's my great pleasure to present him to you, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. President, trustees of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here tonight as your guest speaker. I was first tempted to visit this city some 15 years ago by memories of having once read the childhood recollections of the sage of Baltimore, Henry Lewis Mencken. He had said that his native city lay very near the immense protein factory of the Chesapeake Bay and out of the bay it ate divinely. <laughs> I well recall, he went on, the time when prime hard crabs of the channel species, blue in colour, at least eight inches in length along the shell and with snow white meat almost as firm as soap, were hawked in Holland Street of summer mornings at 10 cents a dozen. The supply, <laughs> the supply seemed to be almost unlimited. I couldn't wait to get here. <laughs> True, they had been struck the occasional cautionary note. The opinion of Mencken's father in particular that all Baltimore beers were poisonous. <laughs> Best kept, he said, for tradesmen, officials, and Class D social callers. <laughs> but clearly I hadn't read on very far. Had I done so, I now find I would have learned about the great epidemic of typhoid fever every summer, a wave of malaria every autumn, and more than a smattering of smallpox every winter of being overrun by flies and immense swarms of mosquitoes, of all the sewers emptying into the back basin, resulting in a powerful aroma every spring, which by August smelled like a billion polecats. <laughs> I hadn't read on, I did come, and my wife Rosie and I have been coming back frequently ever since. Mencken's most stringent criticism of his fellow citizens had been that Baltimoreans of those days were complacent beyond the ordinary. Sometime in the past couple of decades, that complacency was shaken off in no uncertain way and plans laid for the extraordinary revitalization of this great city and port we see so magnificently around us tonight. We can still enjoy the crabs 
but the effluvia of late 19th and 20th century industrialization has been swept away. I can't, on the other hand, update you on the properties of Baltimore brewed beer, because I haven't been able to find any. <laughs> Tonight, I want to talk to you about New Zealand, yesterday and today. In particular, I want to share with you an account of the political and economic reforms we have undertaken in the past decade and to canvas the New Zealand-United States bilateral relationship. Let me first tell you something about my country. New Zealand has a population of just over three and a half million people, equivalent to a typical state in the United States. Frequently described by the media here as a tiny island country in the distant South Pacific, it is in fact one of the world's major island groups stretching 1,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean, midway between the equator and the South Pole. Its nearest neighbours, Australia, Fiji and New Caledonia, are more than 1,000 miles away. The two main islands of New Zealand, poetically known as the North Island and the South Island, <laughs> cover an area of about 105,000 square miles. If you were to lay New Zealand down the east coast of the United States, it would stretch from New York to Miami. In addition to people, we have 50 million sheep, 9 million head of cattle, and 80 million possums. <laughs> the possums are of the Australian and not the American variety, and therefore infinitely worse. <laughs> it is a curious fact that the least desirable of these introduced animals is by far the most numerous. We have not, however, thought it prudent to extend to any category of them the opportunity to vote. <laughs> New Zealand's political life is based on a parliamentary system inherited from the British. In contrast to the United States, we do not have a bicameral system. Instead, our parliament has only one house. Traditionally, we have had a two-party system with the executive in the form of the cabinet in firm control of the legislature. Some of this has now changed. On October the 12th this year, 92% of eligible New Zealanders participated in a general election based on a mixed... <laughs> Unlike our Australian friends, voting is not compulsory. The general election based on a mixed member proportional representation voting system similar to that in Germany. The result turned out as pre-election polls had anticipated, no single party having sufficient votes to form a majority government. Coalition negotiations continue with the previous government carrying on in a caretaker capacity. And I have to say the markets seem very pleased. The uh, absence of a new government has caused our stock market to rise. <laughs> Mortgage rates have already fallen by a full percentage point. <laughs> the New Zealand dollar has strengthened at much higher levels against the United States and Australian dollars. And our last quarter's budget surplus came in well above forecast. In future, the significance of Parliament will undoubtedly increase and it will become less likely that governments will be able to act as radically and decisively as they have in the past. We will have more checks and balances. But I am confident, as indeed the markets also seem to be, that we now have a very sound economic policy framework in place supported by a majority of the population. Now, my job as New Zealand ambassador in Washington is to take the broad view of the New Zealand-United States relationship and of New Zealand's interests and to help create and maintain the conditions in which our government and members of our community can pursue these interests in the right places and with the right people. It also means that I have to eat and drink a lot for my country. 
and have ready to hand an ever fresh supply of America's Cup jokes. It's tough work, but somebody's got to do it. <laughs> Actually, my wife made me promise that I wouldn't tell any America's Cup jokes tonight, which means that you don't get to hear any of them. Like, uh, <laughs> like the one about the greatest follower of New Zealand yachting being Dennis Connors. It'll, think about it, it'll come to you. Many of you in this audience will be interested principally in the political relationship with the United States, and that's appropriate, not only for its intrinsic importance, but also because political relations with any country have a bearing on how we do business together. For others, New Zealand will be of most significance for the trade, investment and transport opportunities it offers this dynamic commercial hub. Now, the good news is that our political relationship with the United States is now in excellent shape. Until a couple of years ago, you may have noticed that that date coincided with my arrival in this country. <laughs> I just, just thought I would underline that. Until a couple of years ago, a security disagreement dating back to the mid-1980s had cast a long shadow, precluding, for example, key contact at head of government and ministerial level and visits. But after his encounter with our Prime Minister at that first APEC leaders meeting in Seattle, President Clinton concluded that disengagement of this kind was not in either country's interests and instituted a review of the relationship which led to a subsequent decision on the President's part, and a bit of jargon here, to normalise political and military contact and dialogue at all levels. Uh, to some of us it may have seemed strange that when for the first time in over a hundred years you had a serious problem between two countries, the decision should be taken to stop talking to each other. Um, but there we are, we're back talking to each other. That's what the jargon means. As a result, we had last year the outstandingly successful visit to the United States by my Prime Minister, which dramatically lifted New Zealand's profile with the administration and Congress, as well as in business circles. Mutual friends around the world were reassured by this move, as were citizens in both countries. Other New Zealand ministers have also established excellent relations with their American counterparts. Our views on world affairs carry considerable influence with the administration out of proportion, I believe, to New Zealand's military or economic weight. I think most people in the United States have forgotten that there was a security dispute with New Zealand, let alone what it was originally all about. The administration, however, as with its Republican predecessors, regards the lack of unconditional access to New Zealand ports for some of its Navy vessels as unfinished business, which it expects to see addressed before Alliance cooperation can be fully restored. The New Zealand government, for its part, has made it clear that changes to our anti-nuclear -nuc legislation are not on the agenda. This remaining difference does therefore continue to pose a challenge for those of us charged with managing the bilateral relationship. Self-evidently, the continued lack of opportunity to exercise directly with American military forces will have implications for our ability to operate effectively with them whenever this is required by international circumstances. And there have been recent opportunities for the New Royal New Zealand Navy to deploy with the United States Navy in pursuit of UN objectives. Nonetheless, it is my firm view that the relationship is secure and stable and that these residual constraints do not compromise our ability to pursue most of our ambitions for the relationship and specifically our economic goals. New Zealand's prosperity depends on trade. Our domestic market is small, so export earnings are vital if we are to grow and create new jobs. New Zealand has only 0.3% of world trade, or about the margin for statistical error. <laughs> but in world agriculture, 
particularly in terms of temperate climate products where the politics of agriculture are the most difficult, New Zealand is not a small player. We are by far the largest cheap meat exporter in the world. We are the second largest dairy exporter with some 20% of world trade. We're a major beef exporter, around the fourth largest, and it depends on the year. How many of you know that New Zealand is, uh, New Zealand's largest export to the United States is beef, and that if you eat hamburgers, you've probably uh, have been eating New Zealand product. We're also a significant force in some horticulture trades, particularly kiwi fruit and apples. For many years, it was a commonplace to remark on New Zealand's highly unusual pattern of trade. We had a high dependence on the export of relatively unprocessed primary commodities, a negligible manufacturing export sector, and if we go back more than 20 years, an extraordinary dependence on one market. Our living standards were those of a developed country. Our economic structure was that of a developing country. The reasons are well known. They arise from our economic and political history. There is only a little poetic license behind the observation that, in economic terms, New Zealand was for many years an offshore farm for Britain. With the uh, benefit of hindsight, we might have wished our forebears had made rather different choices, but the arrangement had a certain logic to it. For all practical purposes, we then enjoyed an environment of free trade and agriculture, and we were doing what New Zealand did and does best. Back in Wellington, there's a famous letter on my ministry's files in which the British government after the Second World War complains to the New Zealand government about a decision that year to send only 97% of our butter production to them. <laughs> this uh, unusual and highly specialised structure of external trade provided New Zealanders with what at, was at the time a relatively good standard of living. This was until the underlying realities of geography and post-Second World War European politics imposed themselves on both the United Kingdom and New Zealand. The shift in New Zealand's trading fortunes was a shock of major proportions. On the broader plane, by the late 1970s, New Zealand had one of the poorest performing economies of the Western world. We had not dealt well with the oil shocks, we had high tariff and other import barriers. We had significant levels of farm subsidies. We were burdened with a national debt that was approaching third world proportions. Our top tax rate was a numbing 66%, and we had a gold-plated welfare system that the country could no longer afford. Apart from all that, we felt things were going along pretty well. <laughs> But from 1975 to 1983, the economy barely grew. Unemployment and debt grew, but nothing else did. We were almost as tightly regulated, protected and centralised as any East European country and performing about as well. If we'd been a company, we would have been bankrupt, or at least in this country, operating under Chapter 11. By 1984, the writing was well and truly on the wall. A period of dramatic change was launched to restore New Zealand's international competitiveness. Less than a decade later, the OECD, that rich economies club in Paris, felt moved to describe the reform process in New Zealand as the most comprehensive undertaken in any developed country in recent decades. Today, after 12 years of comprehensive restructuring, few if any countries in the Western world are in better economic shape. Before justifying this claim, it will be helpful to remind you of the nature of New Zealand's economic reforms. Let's look at some of the things we did. We undertook sweeping deregulation of financial markets, floated the exchange rate, removed restrictions on bank competition, and abolished all controls on capital movements. We removed all quantitative controls on imports, something that I wish, an example that I wish that this great country would emulate. We slashed tariff levels. I know such action is commonly referred to as unilateral disarmament in this country. 
It didn't and doesn't seem that way to us. We knew we would be the principal beneficiaries. We comprehensively restructured the tax system, introducing a value-added tax, phasing out others, including inheritance tax, simplifying the system, and cutting direct tax rates. We undertook one of the largest privatization programs in the world, measured as a percentage of GDP, selling enterprises worth over $13 billion since 1987. We sold into private hands 21 government agencies. Our national telecommunication system was purchased by Bell Atlantic and Ameritech. Our railway system went to Wisconsin Central out of Chicago. And International Paper and Rayonia invested heavily in forestry. EDS from Plano, Texas bought our government computer center. Imagine buying a computer center off a government. And they paid us for it as well. <laughs> there have been a number of other major US investments in other parts of the country such as H.J. Heinz of Pittsburgh, single biggest overseas investment they've ever made, buying our largest exporter of processed foods, aiming at the Asian markets. Partly flowing from the privatisation program, but also reflecting a fundamental downsizing and restructuring of government, the number of people employed in the New Zealand public sector was reduced by 59% in the decade after 1984. We abolished all subsidies in the farming sector so that our farmers now get only what they can earn in the international marketplace through their own efforts. After the initial pain, New Zealand farmers adjusted rapidly to liberalisation. They have become more innovative and responsive to markets. They allocate their resources more efficiently and have developed new international customers for competitive new products, and not one of them would go back to the old days of subsidisation. Importantly, and perhaps uniquely among the advanced economies, the employment sector was modernised through the Employment Contracts Act, which abolished the old system of compulsory union membership and replaced it with a more flexible labour relations framework. Finally, we sought to consolidate and lock in the macroeconomic policies underlying these reforms through some important pieces of legislation. The Fiscal Responsibility Act requires the government regularly to report to Parliament on the extent to which government fiscal policies are consistent with generally accepted business practices and to justify any departure from those principles, including, importantly, before any election. You've got to open the books before the election and not afterwards. <coughs> the government also made the central bank independent and made price stability its sole responsibility. The governor of our reserve bank is currently on a contract which requires him to maintain price stability within the range of zero to two percent and if he doesn't do that, he doesn't get paid. So much for the problem and our solutions to it. Let's turn to the results. Real GDP growth over recent years has reached levels of between 5 and 6 per cent. All forecasts, government and private sector, expect growth in the range 3.5 to 5 per cent a year out beyond the turn of the century. We are currently at the bottom of our business cycle and getting real growth of 2.8 per cent, which is more than we used to expect at the top of the business cycle. Despite this strong growth, underlying inflation has stayed around 2 per cent or below since 1991 and is expected to remain at those levels. At the beginning of this decade, unemployment in New Zealand stood at a little over 11 per cent. That's unacceptably high in a democracy. Today the figure is 6.3 per cent and falling. New jobs are being created at the rate of 5 per cent of employment per year. Two years ago, for the first time in nearly 20 years, the government achieved a budget surplus of 3 per cent of GDP. Does anybody here remember budget surpluses? <laughs> 
In the, in the year to 30 June 1996, there was a surplus of 3 billion. The surplus is forecast to grow to 8% of GDP by 1997-98. New Zealand has been, therefore, in the happy position of being able quickly to decrease public debt, which rose from a high of 52% of GDP, which has been reduced to 30% of GDP this year. All foreign currency debt will have been repaid by 30 June 1997, and it will come as no surprise to this audience that I don't get anything like the number of free lunches that I used to. <laughs> Bankers do not like people who pay back money, and they certainly don't like them when they pay them back ahead of time. <laughs> the government has, on a prepaid basis, lowered personal and corporate tax rates this year, and at the same time, invested more in priority social areas such as health and education. Both Moody's and Standard & Poor's, the international credit rating agencies, have further upgraded New Zealand's credit worthiness. We have now nudged ahead of Australia for the first time since these ratings were established and are just one notch below the world's most secure economies. This move reflected the rating, rating agency's judgment that a strong majority of New Zealanders supported the thrust of the economic reforms of the last decade. For the past three years, the World Competitiveness Report has rated New Zealand the top country in the world for government policies most supportive of business and for the long-term competitiveness of domestic economic policies. The Heritage Foundation from Washington, its 1996 Index of Economic Freedom, places New Zealand in fourth position the highest of any OECD country above the United States in seventh place. Australia is ranked 17th. I refer to Australia from time to time, you want to notice. <laughs> Following on from my earlier remarks about the dominance of agriculture in New Zealand's export economy, the improvement in our competitive position overall has led to strong growth also in the export of manufactured goods and services. ETMs, elaborately transformed manufacturers, for example, have come from nowhere a few years ago now to be the second most important category of New Zealand exports to the United States. In 1994, our manufactured exports to the United States grew by 42%. Finally, and as a bonus for American friends wishing to engage in trade and investment with us. This year, New Zealand again came out on top of Transparency International's charts as the least corrupt country in the world in which to do business. Australia. <laughs> Australia was seventh, and yes, the United States itself was in 15th place. All of this suggests to me an economy which is stabilising at rates of non-inflationary growth well above historical levels. We are well set for the 21st century. On the evidence I have just given, this achievement has been based on principles of openness, economic liberalism and free trade. There are close linkages between these economic policies designed to promote efficiency and a greater export orientation and our outward-looking trade strategy. A systematic policy approach aimed at increasing productivity and lowering costs generally must in time change any country's trade policy. It also allows a much more proactive negotiating posture. New Zealand can today welcome, indeed help lead the charge for global and regional economic liberalisation initiatives. Another important measure of both New Zealand's openness and attractiveness to the outside world is our success in competing in the fiercely competitive world of international investment. The stock of foreign investment in New Zealand by 1994 totaled $90 billion, an increase of $8 billion over the previous year. Of greatest interest to this audience, however, is that the United States, with currently a 43% share has now become our single greatest source of new direct investment. 
ahead of Australia, Europe and Asia in that order. I've already detailed some of the largest recent US investments in New Zealand. We in New Zealand, however, cannot afford to rest on our laurels. Change is a continuous and indeed a never-ending process. The conviction with which we set, out, uh, set about reshaping the New Zealand economy and the continuing lesson from that experience is that countries that want to disconnect themselves from the global economy have no future. We strongly believe that the only way to get higher standards of living is to be an active player in the world economy. The only way constantly to burnish your competitive performance is to increase your degree of exposure to outside market forces. In this regard, there is a great deal that each country can do for itself. To take just one example, I've already mentioned that the unilateral reduction of import barriers is seen as no folly in New Zealand. By the year 2000, the great majority of our tariffs will be in the 0 to 5 per cent range. Already the average tariff paid in the New Zealand market by US exporters is less than 1 per cent. It should come as no surprise and as no coincidence that the United States maintains a healthy and growing trade surplus with my country. More significantly, the government has committed itself to a further review of, of tariffs in 1998, uh, asking the question how completely to eliminate tariffs. It would, of course, be improper of me to get involved in the ongoing debate in this country about the relationship between the United States and the global economy. Lessons learned from a small, distant and rather simple economy such as New Zealand's are unlikely to have application in such a huge, rich and diverse economy or rather set of economies which constitutes the United States. Our political systems are also rather different. Nonetheless, let me put diplomatic protocol a little to one side and draw a conclusion anyway, <laughs> if perhaps more obliquely than usual. External economic linkages are the lifeblood of the New Zealand economy and are very important here in the United States. New Zealand and the United States have traditionally shared similar views about what distorts the efficient operation of international markets and, per contra, what improves their operation. It is important to realise, however, that we have only just begun this journey together toward the still distant level playing field of free world trade. We in New Zealand intend to maintain an outward looking stance in our domestic policies. We will be at the head of the queue for further WTO World Trade Organisation negotiations with the aim of securing further improvements in world trading rules. We will be playing an active and positive role in negotiations on the new generation of trade issues. And we will continue to be involved in regional trade and economic arrangements which are outward looking, open minded, consistent with our domestic policy directions and Asia Pacific friendly. Finally, we will continue to work bilaterally with our key trading partners to enhance mutual trade opportunities and to resolve trade problems. We need and intend to develop closer relations with all our major traders. Our closer economic relations agreement with Australia is the most comprehensive bilateral free trade arrangement anywhere in the world and will, I believe, be made even better. We are talking about free trade possibilities with Chile and together with our Australian friends with the Southeast Asian nations. Why not then a New Zealand-United States free trade agreement? We are close enough to the goal already to at least contemplate an extra effort and we are both already committed to comprehensive free trade in our region through the APEC process by a date certain. Provided it meets the critical tests of openness and comprehensiveness, New Zealand would gladly commence discussions with the United States on this subject tomorrow. All our efforts towards openness and freer trade, however, will be ineffective and ultimately fruitless without the continued leadership of the United States of America. Without that leadership, there would have been no GATT-Uruguay round outcome. 
Without that leadership, there will be very little prospect of further progress and free trade at the regional and international level to our advantage, the advantage of the United States, and to the benefit of global peace and prosperity. It is often said, and rightly so, that the United States has the largest open economy in the world. In the light of the restructuring program we have undertaken over the past 10 years, New Zealand now has one of the most open and competitive economies in the world, in some respects, as international experts have observed, now more open than that of the United States itself. The benefits of this common openness should be self-evident within each of our countries, and so should the compulsion it provides to move forward strongly together. I've dwelt at some length on these essentially economic themes because they are critically important to both our countries and because I am by professional background and interest a trade and economic specialist. As someone once said, one of those people who is also good with statistics but doesn't have the personality to be a CPA. <laughs> there are, however, many other important dimensions to the mutual involvement of the United States and New Zealand in regional and world affairs, and it must never be forgotten that without peace and stability, prosperity is a very fragile flower. I'll be happy to discuss political and security issues in more detail in response to your interest. And, and now, in tribute to recent elections in both countries, let me finish with an anecdote uh, about Huey Long, the kingfish from Louisiana. <laughs> Some of you may have already heard it from his son, but it bears repeating. Once, while in the thick of campaigning for re-election as governor, Huey Long arrived home at the official mansion late at night in a well-lubricated condition. He finally got the key in the front door and turned the lock, but then fell headfirst through and sprawled in the hallway. According to Senator Long, his mother was lying in wait for her husband and partially descending the staircase, demanded to know with barely sustained southern courtesy exactly what he thought he was doing down there. And the governor raised himself on one elbow and slowly replied, well, it seems I must now abandon my prepared address and instead take questions from the floor. <laughs> Thank you and let's have your questions. If Mr. Mencken were still with us, his welcome would be enthusiastic, of course. The floor is now open for questions. Yes, sir. Uh, an expression of gratitude for the hospitality of New Zealand during World War II was expressed. Thank you very much indeed. I uh, uh, have had the great pleasure since, uh, since being in the United St States this time to have been made a life member of the Second Marine Division Association. I try never to miss their annual assemblies. Uh, they're a great bunch of people, and we are eternally, uh, eternally uh, grateful. I think one of the nicest war memorials uh, that I've ever seen was a war memorial to the Second Marine Division uh, in New Zealand, um, and it just says uh, none of that sort of usual hyperbole, uh, nothing in Latin. It just says. If you ever need a friend, you've got one. Two, two questions. I didn't expect that as our second uh, question for you. The uh, first question is uh, uh, your tie. And the second question is uh, a career as a stand-up comedian. I think by the time I retire, I'll be so old it'll have to be in the capacity of a sit-down comedian. 
The tie, the tie, I'm pleased you noticed it, uh, is from uh, UPenn, Uni University of Pennsylvania. The reason uh, I'm wearing it is because there is a, an advanced uh, education program uh, from the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania being undertaken with New Zealand. Um, this tie also represents one of the few strokes of luck I've had here in Washington as a diplomat. I was calling on the uh, Secretary of the Navy the other day, uh, John Dalton, and I was a bit late and I scrambled to get myself ready and came along with this tie on and he said, uh, Mr. Ambassador, he said, you're the first foreign representative that's ever known about my alma mater and done me the courtesy to wear, <laughs> to wear a tie. Two questions. The current relations uh, between New Zealand and the United Kingdom. The second question, uh, how are you getting along with the French in the South Pacific? Well, I think the I think the current relationship with uh, with the United Kingdom is is very warm and positive, I and mean, it's uh, it's obviously a situation where the original colonial powers had to adjust, uh, as have the, the the former colonies of of that colonial power, and we've all adjusted. In the meantime, the United Kingdom has has gone through the process of joining the. European Union, and there are further adjustments to take place there. Uh, we have gone through this uh, long and difficult um, uh, process of finding our way in the world when most of the certainties associated with our former relationship with the United Kingdom have, have, uh, were removed, and, and removed in fairly short order. I touched on the economic consequences of that in my speech. I think the institutional and, and, and personal ties, of course, uh, between the two countries um, go on. I should also point out, too, that while I, I, I talk about the place of New Zealand in the dynamic Asia-Pacific region, we're in fact uh, um, uh, currently enjoying a reasonably balanced uh, global trade pattern. We essentially have four major markets, roughly of the same order of size. Uh, the first is Australia. Uh, the second would be North Asia based on Japan. Uh, the third would be North America based on the United States. And the fourth would be the European Union itself, including uh, obviously the British market. And that's very comfortable. I mean, we don't have a strong uh, economic dependence on any one part of the globe. And I think that's something we're very comfortable with. And it's very pleasing that we've been able to maintain through the United Kingdom, a very strong uh, interest in, in, in Europe. Um, so uh, uh, that's been good. Uh, how are we getting on with the French? Uh, now that they've um, uh, stopped uh, testing nuclear weapons in our backyard and have undertaken to dismantle their testing sites and uh, to close those operations down, together, uh, down forever, we're getting on terrifically. It's just um, a pity in some ways that we had to go through yet another round of, um, of that sort of activity in our part of the world um, before we uh, reached what is, uh, what is uh, a very pleasing outcome. Uh, your opinion or view on Chinese assertiveness in your area? I don't think we see uh, um, direct signs of Chinese military assertiveness uh, in our area, which uh, immediate area, which uh, is the South Pacific uh, and the broad ocean areas of uh, of the Southern Pacific, um, uh, I think uh, what we see is a need, which I guess is the reason, one of the reasons why Secretary Christopher is in Beijing. I think as we speak, what we uh, see is a need to engage uh, the Chinese in a discussion in our region about political and security issues. I think we've made quite a lot of progress uh, in that. There is a, a grouping, a, a, a process called the ASEAN Regional Forum, which has a security dialogue dimension to it. Uh, and if you'd asked me five years ago whether we would have seen a situation where China and a number of other countries from the Asia Pacific Rim were sitting down uh, beginning to talk more and more openly about political and particularly security issues in that sort of regional forum, I would have had some doubts about whether that was possible. Um, so I think, uh, we think, the name of the game is engaging China uh, in our region uh, and trying to open up um, as uh, calm and as productive a dialogue as possible on a range of security issues. 
No, I don't, I don't think it's right in terms of population. That population has actually been going, growing quite strongly over the last couple of years after, I would guess, a couple of decades of uh, stagnation or even in one or two years decline. Um, the reason why it declined and why it is now increasing, the principal reason, is that because New Zealanders, of course, are free to move to and from New Zealand and do so, and they have free entry uh, to our much larger neighbour, Australia. So when relative economic conditions in the two countries vary, then New Zealanders move to take advantage of it. Uh, for much of the last couple of decades, they found the economic opportunities uh, with a wider range and, and of more interest in Australia, and large numbers of them went to Australia. New Zealand politicians standing for election uh, quite often campaign in major Australian cities to get votes. So um, these are New Zealand votes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and, and of course the reverse has happened in the last couple of years as we've begun to enjoy these uh, very uh, significant fruits of economic restructuring and form. A lot of New Zealanders have come home. A lot of New Zealanders, as our economy has expanded and diversified, have seen opportunities which simply weren't there for them before in terms of their professional skills or their entrepreneurship. And so a lot of New Zealanders have come home. Of course, we do also have a, um, a positive immigration policy. We do need to look around the world for skills which we don't have in sufficient supply in New Zealand. And we have a transparent points-based um, uh, immigration system. Uh, you can get a piece of paper from my embassy and you can count up the number of points you would be entitled to and you can work out for yourself whether you would be eligible in terms of points received to, to migrate to New Zealand and if you get the number of points then you're in. So uh, that's the basis of our immigration policy. We are seeking to attract, uh, to, to attract um, uh, immigrants to New Zealand with something to offer us. Um, under those circumstances, of course, if you place your immigration policies on a competitive skills and education-based foundation, then the reality is that you're going to get most of your immigrants from Asia because Asians are better educated and have better skills on average than the rest of us. And so that is also true in New Zealand. I would say something over 60% of new migrants, other than family reunification, uh, uh, people are uh, coming from Asia and we welcome that uh, and they're bringing a lot of skills and quite often a lot of investment with them. Would you comment on the Maori influence in New Zealand? Well I think we're in a, in a very interesting uh, stage of relationship with our Maori people in New Zealand. They have been through as uh, many uh, indigenous peoples have a, a, a strong revival of language and culture, which I think has given them a lot of self-confidence. Um, and they have been negotiating over the past few years uh, through a legal tribunal system which we have in place, uh, and directly in some cases um, with uh, the government uh, for the uh, redressing the settlement of long-standing grievances, usually over over land, but also in the most, um, in, in the largest instance, in fact, over access to um, uh, marine resources. Uh, the marine resource settlement was uh, comprehensive and, and very large, uh, so that Maori uh, interests now uh, own the largest uh, 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 fish catching and exporting um, companies in New Zealand as part of, part of their settlement. They gained access to that resource. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there is some radicalism uh, evident among some uh, Maoris, particularly younger ones, but that, in my view, is a reflection of the progress that's being made. I mean, we do have a system which is generally accepted by the majority of the population in place for at last, after generations of looking the other way and trying to avoid these issues, we do have a system in place of settling the grievances there. Maori people in New Zealand are going to have access, already have access, to large economic resources, uh, which they are free to make what they can of, and most of them are making a very good fist of developing those economic resources into uh, profitable and competitive uh, companies, in, including operating overseas. So. Uh, we're going through a little bit of um, surface uh, turmoil from time to time, but I think that the long-term 
uh, longer term prospects are very good. Uh, of course, in terms of their place in society, I mean, Maoris were the first to arrive in New Zealand, uh, and we're, uh, we're all immigrants together. It's just that I guess that some of us arrived later and some of us arrived sooner. So their place in society is, uh, is legally and, and every other official way the same as anybody else's. But the difference is that they've gained self-confidence uh, through uh, returning to their own culture and their own language uh, and through obtaining access um, to very large economic resources which is going to provide them with, um, with very good assets and, and give them the opportunity to plough back those assets into areas such as education and the way that they want to do that. Um, so I'm optimistic. Focusing on China or using that as a point of departure, should trade relations be contingent upon human rights standards? I had the uh, privilege last night in New York at the 40th anniversary dinner uh, of the Asia Society to hear Dr. Henry Kissinger uh, on the subject. And I mean, I think uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger is right. I mean, we have to, of course, indicate what we have a preference for. Uh, in all our dealings uh, with other countries. And if that means we have a, a preference for democratic political systems and uh, stringent uh, standards for the observation of human rights and so forth, then we have to make that preference known. Um, frankly, if we were to make uh, our trade relations with, e with each and every country contingent upon them adopting in a way which we would like to see, those same, same standards or same systems, then we would end up trading uh, with maybe half a dozen of us uh, and ignoring the rest of the world. I mean, it is simply not practicable uh, for a country like New Zealand, which is uh, to an overwhelming degree dependent upon trade with the rest of the world to organise itself uh, stringently in that way. Um, so uh, when we come to a country like China, of course, in all our confidential uh, dealings with the Chinese government. We take the opportunity to raise with them human rights issues um, in the way that we would want to do and our people would expect. But we do not tie improvements in human rights record of any government uh, to uh, our ability and willingness to trade or to have economic dealings with them. The only exceptions to that have been very uh, rare and that is when the United Nations would agree to oppose mandatory uh, trade and economic sanctions on the country. Um, that has only happened once or twice, and probably the only uh, reasonably successful instance of it was with the former regime, and uh, as far as the former regime in South Africa was concerned. But mostly economic sanctions don't work. I mean, just at the practical level, you don't want to get involved in them uh, unless you can help it because they don't work. Secondly, when we talk about human rights, what are we trying to do? What we're trying to do is not take over other countries and impose our regime of the observance of human rights on that country. We are trying to get the government of the country concerned to change and improve its behaviour. And I don't know of any way that is usually less calculated to change people's behaviour in a positive way if you impose sanctions upon them and threaten them and boycott them and cease talking to them. It, it, it just rebels against my conception of human nature. So I think you've got to engage with those people. You've got to have a very positive example to show yourself. Uh, you've got to be in the company of a lot of like-minded people who also value what you're trying to do but uh, primarily you have to engage with that uh, government, no matter how unpalatable it might seem to be, and then try and induce them to modify their behavior. Has there, on. Been, oh, sorry. Has there been a, uh, a tension between uh, your economic development and, and preservation of the environment? Well, let, let me make a, 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 some observations. First of all, you have to remember that farming in New Zealand is uh, of an extensive livestock-based uh, nature. And uh, we don't have um, the same intensity of environmental, adverse environmental consequences that you get from intensive farming uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, for example. Um, we don't, uh, 
we don't have uh, uh, certain practices uh, which uh, uh, which cause environmental problems. We don't have waste disposal problems. We don't have a huge dependence on either fertilizers uh, or uh, pesticides to control uh, the uh, production base of, of, of that agriculture. Um, and also remember that uh, in New Zealand, grass grows uh, on all but about uh, two days of the year. So basically, we send the animal out to feed itself and, and claim credit and the money for all of that. Uh, so it is not an intensive industry in New Zealand. Um, there are, it is true, uh, when you're worried about global wa warming, one or two uh, bodily functions which large numbers of livestock perform which are not particularly helpful. Uh, the same incidentally is true of humans. Uh, and I'm not quite sure what we can do about that. What we have managed to do, perhaps fortuitously, however, is to develop uh, very large-scale man-made plantation forests in New Zealand. Now, let me be quite clear. We did that for commercial reasons, uh, but the reality is that those huge man-made plantation forests in New Zealand do, in terms of, of the environment, uh, provide a, a very nice balancing uh, effect within our environment uh, for the polluting effects of agriculture and industry. On balance, we've got it about right, I think, although obviously we all want to make some progress. Where we have um, been very innovative, and I think have a unique approach, is how we manage the balance, the difficult balance between economic development and environmental concerns. What we did about uh, four years ago, five years ago, as we, I mean, we were a bit like the United States. We had hundreds of pieces of uh, environmental protection legislation. You had water, we had a piece of legislation. Endangered species, piece of legislation. Uh, wetlands, piece of legislation. Air, legislation. We basically folded all our legislation into one big piece of legislation called the Resource Management Act, which sets down some general principles that you must observe when you're trying to undertake economic development in an environmentally sensitive way. So it sets down some principles. It sets down some processes about who can get involved in consideration of those issues, and basically it says that anybody can, uh, and sets it by down some processes whereby you get involved in those discussions. Uh, on behalf of the audience, Mr. Ambassador, uh, we thank you for a very direct and comprehensive treatment of New Zealand and for an altogether splendid evening. Thanks so much. <laughs>